kuyonying da ga in ga o olumong ha olumika so chang to neng ja le kho tu chu i chong to neng so tla ja le kho tu chu tu chu zu ke hlu ke hlu pe ma lu ke le ha nu zu ke yang yang nyo mong i chi le ja le kho tu chu praise the lord all nations sing his praises all peoples for his mercy toward us is great and the truth of the lord is everlasting praise the lord ตอนจูยิงจิงยาเปคอกะตาจิงยาเปคอทอกเปโตฮูรุโตเจสเตชิเปคอกะฮูเปโลเนงสุสุนูตอกะกะยะตูจูกุยองชังเปลกะจูเ
扬长，抓住耶稣扛，古鲁耶鲁山朱里扎住耶稣扛。Praise God! You guys may be seated. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 to 12. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 to 12. Okay. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 to 12. Nguyen nguyen le no. For I would have you know brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you because you are God, the creator of all things. All honor and glory be to you. And Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, for this time, this moment, this hour, to come and worship this way with our congregation as a body. And Lord, we ask that you be with the speaker today May you speak to him, through him, to us, and help us, Lord, to prepare ourselves to hear your message today, to receive your message, to speak to our hearts, to speak to our lives. And we thank you, Lord. And Lord, help us to remember that this world is not our home, that this world is not our place for us to put our faith and trust in you <clears throat> for all the things that you have blessed us with. We bring back a portion as tithes and offerings to you. Help us to give it happily and faithfully, and may you continue to bless us with the things we need to live on this world. Lord, we, we are here to worship you. May all that we do today be to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Uh, before I dive into the sermon, just a announcement on behalf of uh, the youth. Uh, once again, we're going to start the Sunday school classes for anyone 15 and younger. Uh, we'll be starting that the first three weeks of every month, starting in October. So uh, anyone 15 years or younger, um, please join us in youth Sunday school class. Um, the way it works is before my dad comes up and preaches, after uh, the prayer for offering, uh, the youth will go out into the lobby, and then we'll go and head off to class. Uh, if there's any questions about that, uh, feel free to ask me. Uh, with that being said, uh, before we dive into scripture, let's go ahead and pray. God, we thank you so much for uh, this Sunday morning that you have given to us to come to church, to worship you, to fellowship, and to hear your word, Lord. I pray that you would use me as a tool to uh, showcase who you are to your people and that you would uh, pierce their hearts and convict them, but also teach them and love on them as well. We pray all this in Jesus' name we pray. Name we pray. Amen. Uh, so previously we had um, touched on the book of Galatians, and so we're going to continue this walkthrough of this letter that Paul writes here. And we previously went through uh, verse 1 to 9, and we saw the urgency of Paul, of him trying to address a heresy in the church at the time. It was being spread around that you are saved by Jesus as well as certain works, right? So salvation was not just by Jesus, but also by works that you did. And these heresies were being spread around by Judaizers, right? Jewish people who still held on to the Old Testament, not believing that Christ had come. What they were saying was that you must believe in Jesus, yes, but you must also be circumcised. You must pertain to a certain diet. You must follow certain rules, do certain things. And so Paul writes this letter to the Galatians to make sure that they understand that it is Jesus Christ alone that they are saved by. It is because of him that we have salvation. Now, previously we stopped at verse 9, um, and we're starting at verse 11. So let's kind of take a, a quick look at verse 10 here, which we kind of will glance over here. Uh, verse 10 is sort of like a small transitional point here. It says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God, or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Now, if we remember in verse 1 of chapter 1, Paul says that he is not sent from man, nor through an agency of men, but by God instead. So he proclaims his intention, saying, I am here for the purposes of God by God. Once again, he restates this again to remind us as the audience, as well as the Galatians, saying, once again, I am not here by man or for man, but for the purposes of God. If we remember him writing this beginning introduction, it's for his credentials to tell the Galatians that, hey, I'm saying these things with purpose and with cause, and you can believe me because I'm here on behalf of God. And so Paul here clarifies his stance. And we'll see this a little later on as well. As Paul kind of reveals his previous life, saying, hey, this is who I was and I was all for pleasing man. But now who I am now as Paul, I am for God and pleasing God. And so we find ourselves here in verse 11 as a continuation of Paul's introduction, and most notably, a peer into the life of Paul and his testimony as well. And so as we look at Paul's life transformation, as we read into his introduction, we can take away three key things. One, that God is the origin of the gospel. Two, that God opens the hearts of man to the gospel. And three, that God is the primary source and authority for man. And so let's take a look at verses 11 and 12 here, which we heard shortly ago, but let's read again here uh, in our first point. And it reads here, for I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so once again, this is stating that God is the origin of the gospel, right? 
What Paul is stating here may seem obvious to some, and what he's saying is that the gospel that he's been teaching and preaching, its origins are not from man. It has no dealings with man. It is not a human invention, in other words. Instead, he states that he received it as a revelation from Jesus Christ himself. And we see that in Acts chapter 9, right? He meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. Now, Paul wants to make it known that there is nothing human about the gospel. It was not a man or a woman that one day sat around a campfire and said, you know, I'm going to tell this story about Jesus, and it's going to save people. It was not man that did that. This is a God thing. It is a revelation from God himself. And so what Paul is saying here, that God is the origination of the gospel, and it comes from him as a revelation, kind of helps push this idea that it is Jesus Christ alone that saves. And it kind of comes down into two things. One, this claim bolsters and strengthens the gospel in its essence. And two, it tears down the false claims that the Judaizers were making in Galatia. And so first we'll touch on how it strengthens the gospel in its essence. How does it do this? Well, for one, if the gospel is of divine nature and not of human nature, then it cannot be tainted by things of man. For we know that at essence of man is sin, at the very essence of man is sin. And we are stuck in this perpetual state of sin, and wherever we go and whatever we touch, whatever we deal with, we leave this stain of sin behind. Now, this is just the factual truth. We understand that, yes, we are created in the image of God, yet we have found ourselves incapable of doing good. See, this idea that the gospel saves because of God, it cannot deal with being originated from man, because if man is truly sinful, then man cannot save themselves. A dying man cannot give another dying man the cure, right? A sinful man cannot save another sinful man. For a sinful man made the gospel, then it cannot save. But because the gospel is from God himself, it can save. It is of divine nature. And so if the gospel story were to come from man, then we cannot be saved. But because one who can save, being Jesus Christ, it can save. As I said earlier, a dying man cannot save another dying man, right? And and a small illustration here, right? Um, my, My dad and I, we always talk about one thing, and we've talked about it for a long time, and we really want to do it, but we never do it is we really want to get kayaks, right? We want to get a kayak so we can go fishing and we can you know, go onto the lake versus being on the shore. And we always talk about it, but we never do it. But when we talk about it, one main reason why we never do it is because my mom always interjects and says, you guys can't swim, right? <laughs> if, if both of you guys go out, who's going to save you? If I fall over and my dad can't swim, then he can't save me and vice versa, right? And so a drowning man can't save a drowning man. And so in the same manner, with saving our souls, a dying man cannot save a dying man. But because Christ, who defeated death and gave us life, is the origination of the gospel, it can save us. And so the gospel is not tainted by man, but rather comes from a divine source, and that being God himself. If the saving story of the gospel is thus revealed from God himself as the originating point, then it is not messed with, it is not stained with sin. Rather, it is life-giving and gives us freedom. And once again, God, as the author of life, as the provider of life, gives us life through the story of the gospel. Not only that, but we also recognize that this gospel from God himself stands out from anything that the world has to offer, right? If we think about the gospel in its nature, it's free, right? When we teach this in Sunday school, we tell children, hey, it's a free gift. It's a gift of grace. All you have to do is believe, right? There's nothing that we have to do on our behalf, 
on our own terms to be saved. It's believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's a standing offer that will forever be free. But if we take a look at the gospel story and how it's free and if we believe we are saved and we compare that to the things of this world and what man has come to invent, we can see how they completely contrast each other. If we look at uh, different religions, right? Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, Islam, Buddhism, anything that this world has to offer, what do we know about what they say and what they believe? It's that you are restricted by what you can do. Your salvation is based on your works, right? So in the essence of the religions of this world, man is trying to save himself. You do these things and you will be saved. Compared to Christ has already saved you, there's nothing left that you can do. And once again, if we recall back the main idea of the book, that Christ alone saves, this is Paul continuously pressing home this idea saying, hey, the gospel comes from God alone. God alone can save you. Nothing that you can do, nothing that you need to be done. And so Paul presses home this point. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, period, at the end of the sentence. Nothing continues onward. Now, secondly, this understanding that the gospel is a revelation from God also tears down the claims that the Judaizers were claiming at this time. Now, once again, a reminder of what they were saying. They said that, hey, you're saved by the actions that you do by following the old laws of Moses, by being circumcised, by eating a certain diet, right? Now, what we know about the Judaizers is that they were so particular on these certain items, not for the sake of saving people, not for the sake that it might save you or us, but rather they held steadfast to these ideas just for tradition's sake. These items and traditions that the Judaizers were pressing onto the people in Galatia were traditions recognized in rabbinic tradition or in Jewish tradition, right? The origin of these traditions stems from years and years and years of being passed down orally and written. For previously, when it was just the laws of Moses in the Old Testament, they, they read this and they understood it and they interpreted it, and then they would pass it down, and it would go on from generation to generation. And back then, when... when it had substance and understanding before Christ had come to die on the cross, it meant something, right? But because we know that Christ had come to die on the cross for us, it's not that these things have gone away, but he has fulfilled the law. So everything that we know and we believe and we trust in is in Christ. But these Judaizers have said, well, no, not completely. We still have to do these old things. But rather than have some sort of purpose for them, it's just an activity for activity's sake. It's just tradition for tradition's sake. Thus, their purpose, right, having a certain diet, the purpose of, you know, circumcision, the purpose of doing ritual things became purposeless. It was doing things just to do it. Tradition for tradition's sake. And so it is important to know that the gospel never originated from the mind of a man, but from a revelation from God. And thus, what is preached by Paul and by everyone else, that it is Jesus alone that can save, really helps us and builds us up to remind us of Christ at the center of all things, right? Because it comes from him who has saved it can save us. Because it's not tainted by man, it can save us. Because it's not just words spoken uselessly by man. Because it's not just tradition or things done for no reason, right? There is a purpose behind it. Now, not only is God the origin of the gospel, but he is also the one who opens our hearts to it. And so we'll move on to our second point here in verses 13 to 16a. And here it reads, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. 
and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Now we begin here to to dive into Paul's story, right? We begin to see a glimpse into his testimony and his life. And what he reveals here is a truth that we must remind ourselves continuously of, no matter how mature we are as believers, right? Now there there might be a tidbit in here where we read um, in verse... 15, right, where it seems like we might be diving into something else, but let's just read the text and see what it has to say for us and see what Paul is writing here. So verse 13 begins with Paul retelling who he was before he met Jesus, right? And Saul was his name, as he was called. A man that was on a mission to destroy and persecute those who believed in Christ Jesus. His life revolved around these ideas that the Judaizers were saying as well, right? It was embedded into him. We have seen Paul stress the idea that he was sent by God and not by man. And the reason why he says this is because if we look back at his life, this is what he was doing previously. He says it here in verse 14, right? I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, right? So he's saying that, hey, among those who were Judaizers who believed in Judaism, I was among the best, and I was pushing forward to be the best among my contemporaries, right? To showcase, hey, I am the one who are persecuting those who are doing wrong, right? You believe in Jesus? That's wrong. I will go against you, right? It wasn't enough that people were for him. He had to go against those who were against him, all for the goal of pleasing man and those around him. And as we were saying previously, how the Judaizers were doing things just for doing them, right? Paul expands on that again. He was extremely zealous for his ancestral traditions, for the sake of man, right? For traditions that man just wanted to pass on from generation to generation. Why do them? Well, because they have done it previously. So we will do them as well, and I will teach my children after me, and they will do them because I did them. Not for the purposes of man, but for, or not for the purposes of God, but for man. And so Paul was driven, as Saul, to persecute the church. But then, as we all know, right, he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. Now, here is an interesting thing. Rather than Paul stating that this is the moment where, um, you know, that that God opened his heart and he, he knew God then and God chose him then, he brings it all the way to the very beginning, saying that God had chosen him and set him apart from his mother's womb, stating that God foreknew and saw that this was going to be the person who would minister to the Gentiles and that this was the apostle that he would use as a tool in particular. What Paul is aiming to drive home here is the idea that it is only God who can open up the hearts of man to be saved. God knew Paul while he was still Saul and knew that he would take Saul and transform him into who we know as Paul in this book. It was in God's specific timing, right? Everything leading up to that moment on the road to Damascus. Saul's life, transforming him in that moment, revealing himself to him, revealing who he is, changing him into Paul and using him as a tool. Now, leading up to that moment in Damascus, right, where he met Jesus, I'm sure that there had been moments already where Saul might have heard about Jesus, right? In fact, he knows the Old Testament laws of Moses. Uh, Paul was, in fact, an incredibly educated man who was taught the laws of Moses from when he was a very young man. And so these ideas, the laws of Moses, the Old Testament, were embedded into him. And what we know about the laws of Moses and the Old Testament is that they point to Jesus, right? Everything in the Old Testament, the laws of Moses, they point to Jesus. But even though he was saturated in these things about Jesus from a young age, 
he still did not turn his own heart. And I'm sure even beforehand, there were, there were whisperings about this Jesus. He, he might have been there when certain things were happening. But his heart still did not turn. It stayed hardened. He, he was set on persecuting people. Only when God opens his heart, or his heart, and his eyes and his mind at that very moment in Damascus, does Paul realize who Jesus is. Even though God had prepared Paul from the moment he was in his mother's womb to do work for him, it was still only God that could reveal his truth to Paul. And I'm sure, as I said before, along his entire life, I'm sure there had been many things that pointed to Jesus for him. But no one else, nothing else, could switch his heart to return to God. Now, I do not mean to uh, discredit or demean the importance of evangelism. Evangelism is essential to the Christian faith and spreading the good news. But once again, we understand that we are here to share and to spread. We, we are not here to turn the hearts of people. We tell them, we inform, we plant the seed, we may harvest, we may, we may nurture, right? But we are not the person to turn the heart. That is the Lord himself. And as one um, other preacher put it, right, human ingenuity can never take the place of divine initiative. Once again, human ingenuity can never take the place of divine initiative. And so now we may come to think, well, why is it that it's God only that can turn our hearts, right? What, what have we done? Why can't we do it? Why can't someone just tell me? Why can't I just go to my coworker and say, hey, Jesus loves you, and they you know, magically turn, right? Well, to understand that, we have to look at the truth of who we are, right? We have to understand who we are, and that helps us understand how it is God only who can turn our hearts. All right there in the book of Romans, right? Paul reminds us countless times of who we are. He tells us, hey, you, we have fallen short of the glory of God. No one seeks after him. Uh, we understand that our hearts are wicked and deceitful to the core. And so because of this, man is so adverse to good that they cannot convince themselves of what is right and righteous. They cannot save themselves, as we were talking about earlier. But rather, it is God who must turn our hearts from evil, right, and remind us of who he is. No matter how exposed the person is to the truth, the truth cannot be simply heard by them. It may be told to them, but once again, God has to turn their hearts. As we were saying earlier, Paul himself was exposed to biblical truth. If we take a look at Acts chapter 7, right, we, we see the story of Stephen, how he was proclaiming the truth, he, he, was, he was speaking gospel truths. And yet, we, we take a look afterwards at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, right? So Stephen is, is, is proclaiming the truth, speaking about Jesus. He gets stoned, right? At the very beginning of chapter 8, it says that Saul approved the stoning. So that tells us that Saul was there. Saul heard these things that Stephen was saying. He saw the stoning. He, he knew what was happening. But yet even then, he still did not recognize who Jesus was, did not recognize what the gospel was. Only in Acts chapter 9, when Jesus reveals himself to him, does he realize what the truth is. God opened up Paul's heart, not man. God opened up our hearts, not ourselves, not each other, only God. So Paul is saying that only God can change our hearts and change our lives, right? And if we look at what Paul says in Romans and what I've been saying, right, it kind of feels like a stretch. Are we really that bad? Are we so adverse to good? Are we so, you know, are we drowning in our sins so much so that we can't even put a hand up and say, hey, help me, save me, realize that I am sinning and say, well, I have to go that way, right? Am I, are we so convoluted in this manner? And the answer and the truth is, if we look at the scriptures, it is yes. Because if we could save ourselves, then wouldn't everybody be saved, right? 
And let me, let me put it in this way, using Paul's life as an example, to kind of help us understand this even more. If we remember who Paul was before he was Paul, he was Saul, right? And he was this man that would go out and persecute and murder and destroy things, right? And so if we imagine that we're a person back in this day when Saul is going out and carrying out his activities, right, and doing these things, and we're at our home and we're harvesting our crops, and we have a neighbor, and our neighbor comes up to us and says, hey, I heard that Saul is coming. And so what does that tell us in our minds? We say, well... I have to go. I have to protect my family. I have to protect myself. He's going to come here. He's going to persecute me because I believe in Jesus, right? But then your neighbor says, but here's the crazy thing. Saul's coming, but I heard that rather than doing what he usually does and persecuting the churches and, and, and killing people, instead he's going and he's preaching Jesus and he's telling people about the gospel. What, what would we say? Would we say, wow, he finally changed his heart. Wow, hey, someone must have convinced him. No, that's not what, what would, we would say. We say, only God could have changed his heart, right? Now, we might take a look at that, at that example and say, well, yeah, of course he would say that. That's Saul, after all. That was the man who persecuted people, who killed people, right? His sins were numerous. But if we remember about our sins and who God is as judge, right? He judges sins with no partiality. We're all on the same level, all on the same playing field. We have sinned against the same God, so we must be saved in the same manner. And we, so we must recognize that, hey, if we're all sinners and we're all adverse to good or adverse to good in the same way, then we all have to be turned in the same manner, right? A dying man cannot save a dying man. And we are all on the same level playing field, right? So all of our hearts have to be turned. It's not that, you know, Saul was up here in his sins and we're like down here. And so God has to put more effort to save Saul to, to really turn his heart versus us who just have to hear a whisper and we're good. No, it's every single one of us who have sinned in the same manner, in the same way. Our, all of our hearts are wicked, so all of our hearts have to be turned by God. Now, this is not meant to be a deterrent onto our faith as to say, oh, woe is me, I am so evil, what can I do? But rather, look at it in the other direction and remind ourselves of who God is and his graciousness and his love, right? Trust in God who has saved us to see how good he is that he would save us for our, from our own wickedness to be with him in eternity. And all of this based on his gracious love, that he would save us and turn our hearts now, understanding that it is God who saves and opens the heart of man then moves us into the direction of making sure that God is our primary source and primary authority in our lives. And this brings us to our third point here, verses 16b to 24. Uh, God is the primary authority. And so we'll read here, picking off in 16b. And it says, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But only they kept hearing. He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. And so we begin to see a quick wrap-up of Paul's testimony and story here. Now one thing you guys might have noticed here, is that as Paul reveals himself, as Paul describes his journey, as Paul says that Christ has saved me, we kind of realize that Paul has not pointed out any person in particular, right? Oftentimes when we tell our stories, right, um, when we have testimonial times and people come up here and they, and they tell, and hey, you know, I met God through this way in this manner and um, yada, yada, person A helped me to see Christ, right? 
we see here that Paul doesn't know anybody, but rather he says that, no, it was Jesus. It was Christ himself. It was God who revealed himself to me, right? And it was God who helped me understand and to know and to learn about him. It's not that Paul doesn't want to credit the people who have helped him, right? Because we know in other books of the Bible and the books of Acts that there were people who helped Paul, who taught him, who were with him, who walked with him. But rather, Paul is saying, it was not these people who taught me, who gave me knowledge, who gave me wisdom, but it was God himself and God alone. We take a look at verse 16 here, uh, stating, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Paul is saying that once God had revealed himself, I did not go out and say to, you know, the apostles who had gone before me, to fellow believers around me to say, hey, what can I know about God? How can I learn? What, what, what should I know? What are certain things that I, I should stop doing, that I should keep doing? Rather, what do we see? We, we see that he goes, and he says that he goes to Arabia, right? And when we follow the text, I did not consult anybody. I did not consult the other apostles. Rather, I went away to Arabia. Now, what went on in Arabia? Right? It just says he went to Arabia and then returned once more to Damascus. Well, unfortunately, the text kind of stops there. But what can we infer from knowing Arabia, knowing what Paul has said, and knowing who God is, right? So first, Arabia is a wilderness desert that is east of Damascus near the Sinai Peninsula. Right? So in other words, it's the wilderness. Now, Paul does not go consult other people. He does not consult the apostles. And he goes into the wilderness after he learns about Jesus. So this tells us, and what we can infer from the text and from what Paul is saying, is that he learned about who God was from God himself. Jesus reveals himself to Paul, and then Paul takes this time and opportunity to move out, to go away, and to be with God one-on-one, -on -one, to learn about him, to prepare himself for the ministry that God had set before him. After all, it is Jesus who set Paul out in this ministry, right? He declares that Paul will be the one to minister to the Gentiles. And so Paul himself says, okay, well, you have set this plan out for me. You have said I will minister to the Gentiles, and I will teach them about you. So then I will go to you as the primary source and the primary authority for all things so that I can understand, so I can know, so I can be sustained by you. And it is finally after this time in Arabia that Paul returns to Damascus and then meets up with James. And so what we see here and what Paul writes is that it is God who we must seek to learn, to understand, and to know. Paul sought after God to prepare his own heart. So should we not also follow God in the same manner? It should be his counsel who we seek when there are certain decisions, when we're trying to prepare ourselves for all things. Now, there are important things that we do in the faith, right? We have fellowship, we have discipleship, we mentor one another, we go to those other brothers and sisters to seek them for wisdom. And those are all great things. But the primary source and the primary authority for knowledge, wisdom, understanding, for the truth, is God himself. And for some reason, we tend to leave him at the very end, as the last resort, right? You know, just a couple examples of things that we go through in life, large decisions, right? When we're going to buy a new car, we're going to buy a new house, we're going to pursue someone in a relationship, we're going to get a new job, or we might be moving away. All these things, right? If we're going to go, if we're going to stop, we're going to push, we're going to pull, and we seek counsel, more than often, what do we do? Now in this day and age, grab our phones, do a little Googling, do a little research. Hey, what is, you know, what's the internet got to say about this? You know, what is the result on Google? Um, I want to move to you know, Kentucky. OK, Google, all right. Uh, crime rate in Kentucky. All right, it looks good this way. Now let me go ask somebody, right? Hey, you lived in Kentucky. What was it like? Was it good here? Was it great here? What's the work like? What's the job like? What's the environment like? What are the people like? And then by the time we've already made the decision, hey, we're, gonna move, we're, we're moving to Kentucky. Oh, yeah, uh, 
hey, God, I'm going to move to Kentucky. Uh, can you help me out a little bit? Uh, help my, prepare my heart, prepare my soul. Well, you've already decided for yourself, right? God should be the primary source, the primary authority for all things before we make decisions, right? We see that in Paul's life. He prepares himself, right, for God's mission that he set before him. Now, one major reason is because Paul understands, oh, okay, God, you have set me out to do these things, so I will discuss with you how to prepare myself so that I may know how to do what you have planned out for me to do. And so for ourselves to know, right, because God has planned our lives, because God has moved our lives in a certain direction, wouldn't we go to him to, to ask, hey, um, I see you're taking my life in a certain direction. Could you please aid me, give me faith, give me understanding, give me knowledge, give me the truth so that I may move in the direction you are trying to move me to, right? Rather than God has a plan for me, nah, I'll Google it. We go straight to the source, right? We seek him, we seek his word, we pray to him, we ask for knowledge and understanding. There was a, uh, a time in college where I was taking a course with a professor, and it was my first time with him, and he was a very intimidating professor. Extremely professional, syllabus extremely organized. His shirt was like pleated perfectly. And so speaking to him was not going to be on my schedule. But as I was kind of looking through the syllabus, I saw on there that there was two papers. And they were like a hefty portion of our grade. And the first one was coming up in a couple weeks. And I read the description, and I was like, I don't get it. I read it, again, I didn't get it. I didn't get how it tied into what we were learning. I didn't get how it tied into the book we were reading. So I asked my roommate who was in the class with me, I was like, hey, do you get the book, or do you get the, the, the assignment? Do you understand the paper that we're supposed to do? And he was like, uh, I think so. I'm writing on this, so I think that's what he wants us to do, because I think it connects to what we're learning like this. And I was like, uh, okay, that's cool. I don't know if that's right, though. And so I saw a second opinion. I went to another friend who had taken his class previously, and I said, hey, okay, uh, that paper's coming up. You wrote it, right? He's like, oh, yeah, I, I remember writing it. What you write upon? Oh, I wrote upon this. Did you get a good grade? Yeah, it was good enough. Okay, uh, I'm not sure that's what we're supposed to do. So I mustered all my courage, and I went up to him, and I said, hey, professor, I don't understand this paper. Um, I don't get how it ties into what we're learning. I don't get how it ties into the book. What do you want me to write upon? I don't get it. And so he explained to me finally, hey, this is what you're supposed to write. Here's the rubric. Please follow this format, et cetera, et cetera. Only when I went to the source did I understand what I was supposed to do, and only then did I understand the truth, have the knowledge and understanding to move forward. And so in the same way, we are to seek the source, the authority, the one who knows, who will give us understanding and truth. And then if we wrap it all around here in verse 21 onward, we begin to see the fruits of the labor of Paul's ministry, right? His, his ending kind of crescendo here. And so we, we see and we read that he went out to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, yet he was still unknown by sight, right? People didn't recognize him. But what's the important thing that he wants us to know? It's that he was known for what he was saying and what he was doing, not who he was. Right? It says, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. That's what the people were saying. Right? It's not, dude, it's Saul who's doing this. But rather, it's God through Saul, now known as Paul, who's doing these things. Right? Right? And if we kind of bring it all the way back to the beginning, verse 10 and verse 1, how Paul is continually pushing this idea, hey, it's not me, I'm not by man, I'm not doing these things because of man, I'm not doing these things for man, it's for the purposes of God. And then we see it all come back down to fruition here. Hey, these things I'm preaching, it's not for man, it's not by man, it's for God, by God, for his purposes. And at the very end here in verse 24, they were glorifying God because of me. Right? And that's kind of the, 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 
the huge bloom of the flower, if you will, right? And Saul turning into Paul, revealed Christ Jesus to him, is then proclaiming the gospel, therefore allowing people to understand who God is, therefore they will glorify God, right? Now, it might kind of seem like a, a selfish, cocky statement, right? Paul you know, says all these things, right? His credentials saying, I'm here by, by, by God for his purposes, not by man. And at the end of verse 24, it says, and they were glorifying God because of me, right? No, that's not the attitude. It's not a statement of, of like, selfishness. It's a statement of fact, right? Because of his ministries, because of what he said, because of what he's done, because it's Christ's purpose for him to do so, they were glorifying God because, was he, because of what he has done. That really is the culmination of what God has been doing through him. God has been working through Paul so that the people may recognize who God is, so that they may glorify God. And so let me kind of wrap this up all together and conclude this up with the larger idea of the book of Galatians, right? And so I remind us that the big idea of the book of Galatians is that it is Christ alone that saves, right? And so in the first point, God is the origin of the gospel. And so be because God is the origin of the gospel, because it comes from him, it can save us. So therefore, it is Jesus alone that can save because Jesus is God. And then the second point, God is the only one that can open the hearts of man and save them. And so because God opens our hearts, Jesus, being God, is the only one that can save us. And then finally, because God is the primary authority and the primary source for knowledge and understanding to guide us in this life, only Jesus, only God, can save us. Everything here that we just read Although it might just be Paul's introduction, and as we wrap up his introduction and his testimony, and it's this quick kind of, I guess, intro to his thesis of his paper, right? It may just say, hey, I'm Paul. I'm here to write this to you guys. It's really going back to reminding all of us that it is Jesus alone who saves, nothing else. Let's go ahead and pray. God, uh, we once again thank you for this time that you have given us to uh, dive into your word. Uh, continue to remind us that we are saved by you and only you. Nothing that we can do, nothing this world can do uh, can save us. But may we glorify you because of how you saved us from ourselves, Lord. Uh, may we trust in you for all things. May we seek you for wisdom and guidance in this life. As we go out from here, may you protect us, watch over our journeys to work and to school. Give us a great and safe week as we drive home and journey onwards. And if you have not come home yet, uh, we pray that you may guide us back here next week on Sunday to worship you once again. Uh, we love you and we thank you so much for who you are in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.